Good evening and welcome to tonight's PACET webinar. Uh, this webinar is for the PACET TNI program, which is Technology and Integration Support. Uh, tonight we will be talking about the Network Plus exam in 10-005, and we will be covering objectives 3.4 and 3.5. My name is Brian Farrell, and I am the instructor for the PSIT and certificate mentor for the PSIT TNI program. I'm also the instructor for CIS 205 at Edmonds Community College which just happens to be the piece at TNI course, or at least the correlation to it. They're one and the same. And there's some of my certifications and qualifications. So you're probably wondering, what are objectives 3.4 and 3.5? Well, we're going to talk about wide area network technology types and properties, and then we're going to move on to network topologies. If you have any questions about any of the material that I'm presenting tonight, go ahead and speak up or type up, and I will answer them to the best, best of my ability. At the end of the session, I will have an open period where you can ask me any question at all, and I'll answer it. So let's move on to objective 3.4 of the N10-005 Network Plus exam, and let's talk about LAN technology types and properties. The first thing that we need to talk about is what makes a wide area network a wide area network. Uh, and it's not just size. As a matter of fact, it has very little to do with the size of the network, even though it has the name wide area in it. As a general rule, if you own and control the link that the data is being used to get from one place to another, so from router A to router B, and you own the link that goes in between, you are not using a wide area network. You are not using WAN technology. On the other hand, if you are using a form of transmission that you don't own, as in you are um, transmitting over a leased line, or you're sending your data uh, to a packet switch network over the internet, guess what? You are using WAN technology. It really comes down to the fact that if you own the, all of the infrastructure from end to end, it doesn't matter how big it is, it is not a WAN. It might be a metropolitan area, but it is not a wide area network. That's kind of the simple definition of it. So now let's talk about different types of WAN technology, and we'll start with circuit switched. And a circuit switched network is actually contains a dedicated circuit or connection between it two endpoints that are used for communication. While the circuit is used, <coughs> excuse me, while the circuit is set up, it can only be used for communication between those endpoints. A uh, perfect example of LAN technology is when you pick up your telephone in your house, at least if you have a landline, and you dial, uh, let's say, your mother or your father, father's phone number, you call them and they answer the, the phone, you've now created a circuit, and that circuit can only be used between those two points. When should you use circuit switched technology? Well, you should use it when there is a fair amount of traffic that is continuous in nature that needs to travel between two points. That's about the only time that you really want to consider buying a leased line, buying, renting or leasing a line and having a circuit switch network anymore. And one of the advantages of a circuit switch network is there is only one path. You know where the data originates, you know where it's going to end up, and if there's a problem, they're pretty easy to uh, diagnose and fix. Packet switched network, on the other hand, is when the data is broken up into smaller chunks and moved through the network only to be reassembled on the other side. The data traffic is routed using its destination address. With <coughs> circuit switch 
networks you actually do not need an IP address. Helps in the administration if you have one, but it's not absolutely necessary. Packet switched ad, packet switched networks, you have to have an IP address. Why is that? Well, because the data may take different paths through the through the network to reach its destination. As a general rule, packet switched networks are less expensive to maintain. Why is that? Well, because everybody gets to use the network that you're going across. It's not just completely dedicated to your use. So you're not having to pay for it 24-7. Another type of WAN technology that we need to talk about is frame relay. With frame relay, it's a WAN technology in which variable length packets are packets switched across the network. It is less expensive than a leased line. But it can be made to look like a leased line through what are called virtual circuits, or VCs. The virtual circuit gets set up, and, free, and frame relay will track the VCs, the virtual circuits, using what are called data link identifiers, DLC, DLCIs. Something to keep in mind is that the DLCIs are only relevant to uh, the connection that is assigned the DLCI. Uh, I know that sounds a little bit odd, but you could have a DLCI of 20 on one side of the connection, and the DLCI on the other end could be 30, could be 40, could be 80, or it could be 20. It doesn't really matter, because that DLCI is only relevant to the connection that it's close to closest associated with. So when you have a frame relay type network, you purchase <coughs> or you lease um, bandwidth. And when you do that, what you're paying for is, um, well, you're paying for bandwidth. You're paying for speed across the network. One of the first things that you'll find is you'll find that you have an access rate. That access rate is the maximum speed of the frame relay interface. You may purchase 64 kilobits, um, but you may notice that your that your data is actually traversing that link at say 128 kilobits. Yeah, that's a bonus. That's your access rate. It has nothing to do um, with with what is called your committed information rate. That's actually what you're paying for is the committed information rate, which is your guaranteed bandwidth. Your data may go faster, but it is never supposed to go slower. So you have those two things. You have the access rate, which is the absolute maximum speed that your data can travel on a frame relay type network. And then you have your CIR, your committed information rate, which is what you're actually guaranteed as far as bandwidth. And then we have ATM, an asynchronous transfer mode. This is a WAN technology in which fixed link cells, think packets, but each cell is 53 bytes long. And they are packet switched across the network. ATM is really fast. It can handle real-time voice and video. Like I said, it's a really fast technology, but it has very poor bandwidth utilization. That's because of the fixed 53 byte length of the cell. They're never, they're never bigger. They're never smaller. They're always 53 bytes. So you end up with a lot of wasted space, and you end up with a lot of extra packets. Uh, common AT ATM speeds are 51.84 megabits per second and 155.52 megabits per second. For those of you who want to know, uh, that is the equivalent of optical carrier one, and actually I should say optical optical carrier level one and optical carrier level three. Doesn't mean that's that it's necessarily traveling down fiber, but those are kind of what they are associated with. And we will get to those later on in this presentation. 
Hold on a second while I take a breath. <laughs> okay. Let's move on to types of connections. Hey, what do you know? We have dial-up. Uh, dial-up is still a valid WAN technology. Uh, it uses the public switch telephone network, the PSTN, and it sends data over the plain old telephone service or POPs. So it uses the, the PSTN over the POTS using copper wires to send data from end to end. It uses twisted pair wiring to transmit an analog signal. So you need a modem if you're going to use dial-up. Your maximum theoretical speed across the dial-up connection is 56 kilobits per second. Not very fast anymore, but it beats nothing. You can pretty much put in a dial-up connection anywhere, and it will work. Still kind of using uh, the PSTN. Actually, a lot of these use the PSTN in one form or another. But still basically using the PSTN is the Integrated Service Digital Network. The ISDN connection. This is a digital point-to-point -point wide area network technology. It is completely digital. Uh, you get up to approximately 2 megabits per second. Actually, you don't. You get 1.544 megabits per second. But hey, let's round up and call it approximately two. Uh, if you spend enough money, you can have what's called a BRI, a BRI, a basic rate interface. And that gets you a whopping 128 kilobits per second. Now, a BRI uses uh, two B channels, B as in boy, each operating at 64 kilobits per 64 kilobits per second. Kilobits per second. There we go. Uh, one of those B channels is used for data, and one of those channels is used for voice. Or you could just use both B channels for data. Um, personally, I wouldn't use both B channels for voice because then you're spending way too much money. A bri also uses one D channel, as in dog. Now, the D channel on a bri operates at 16 kilobits per second, and it's used for call setup and link management. Much more cost effective than purchasing or leasing a bri is doing a pri, P-R-I, which is a primary rate interface. Now, a PRI can contain up to 23 separate B channels and one B channel. No matter what you, no matter what you use, you always have at least two B as in boy channels, and you always have, uh, you always have one D channel as in dog channel. Now, when you use ISDN, you're, you need to use what's called a terminal adapter, or TA, for the connection of the in nodes to be made, in nodes to be made. The TA looks like a modem, but it is not a modem. It does not uh, modulate and demodulate. And part of the reason why you know that is because ISDN is a completely digital service. Now, ISDN is more expensive than using plain old telephone service or dial-up, and it's not as capable as a digital subscriber line, but an advantage to ISDN is it's kind of like dial-up. You can pretty much get ISDN anywhere that you can run a telephone cable. So I just mentioned DSL, so let's talk about the digital subscriber line. By the way, when you see XDSL, that means it's generic DSL. It uh, doesn't have any qualifier, qualifiers, qualifiers on it yet. We'll get to those in just a moment. Now, DSL uh, uses the plain old telephone system as its media of transporting data. It is a dedicated digital line. Oh, hi, Oscar. Welcome home. Uh, Finally, I have problems with that file. Uh, lots of people do. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm glad you made it. 
Yeah, thank um, you. So you bet. Digital, blah, 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 blah. So DSL uses or is a dedicated digital line between endpoint and a central office or CO. Now it is only possible within a specific distance from a CO. Uh, if you're just running your basic DSL, you have to be within 18,000 feet of a central office. So most of you are kind of scratching your head and going, well, what's that? Yeah, it's essentially a special junction box. It's not really the uh, telephone company or the uh, DSL provider's office. It's actually just a piece of equipment that's called a central office. Now, if you go with the highest rated um, DSL, uh, which is pretty potent stuff, the only problem is is you've got to you have to be within 300 meters of the CO to get that speed. Now DSL does carry voice and data. If you are using it to carry voice, you need to put a filter on between your telephone and the line or else you're going to get just a bunch of static. Your speeds do vary on DSL depending upon your ISP or, or internet service provider and what you're paying for. Now let's talk about the different kinds of DSL. First up is HDSL or high bit rate DSL. It is synchronous in nature. That means that your upload speeds and download speeds are the same. Uh, HDSL was developed in the United States and if you're using HDSL, high bit rate DSL, more than likely, you're not using uh, your regular POTS line, but you are using a leased T1 line. And the reason is, well, you're a, a you're paying for synchronous uh, transmissions, same upload and download speeds. That means you're shuffling a fair amount of data between two points, usually. Then there's SDSL or symmetric DSL. This is another one that's symmetric in nature, but with SDSL you do not carry voice communication. It is data only. Uh, it does not require a leased line, so you can just use a plain old telephone service line. And it's used by businesses that don't need the performance of a T1 line, which is 1.544 megabits per second, so they don't need that much bandwidth, but they are still they are still sending a fair amount of traffic back and forth between a limited number of points. Now let's talk about VDSL, very high bitrate DSL. Uh, used when high quality video and voice over IP is necessary. So this is when you are using, are providing streaming services or you're using streaming services. The current standard for VDSL allows for up to 100 megabits per second over a plain old telephone service line. Like I said earlier, you have to be within 300 meters of a central office. If you fall outside of that 300 meters, um, you could probably pay for VDSL, but you're not going to get that kind of speed. What most of us are used to seeing, when, seeing and hearing when we talk about DSL is ADSL, asynchronous DSL. Now, it is asynchronous in nature. I wonder if that's actually asymmetrical. I think that's asymmetrical DSL which is asynchronous in nature. Yeah, it's asynch asy uh, asymmetrical, excuse me. Just remember, ADSL, the upload speeds and the download speeds vary. And your upload speed is always slower than your download speed. Uh, with ADSL, you can get upload speeds, or common upload speeds, of 768 kilobits per second with download speeds of up to 9 megabits per second. 
if you see ADSL in a network, it's usually going to be implemented in the small office, home office environment. And more than likely, well, that's about all, all the places you're going to see it. You won't really see it in medium to larger size networks uh, just because it doesn't offer good enough performance. So now let's talk about cable uh, WAN technology. So cable is a broadband connection to the premise delivered by the cable company. Here's how it works. All of the cable signal is sent or delivered to what's called the head end. The head end receives all of those signals. They're processed and formatted. And then they are transmitted back out of the head end to the distribution network. The distribution network is a smaller service area served by the cable ISP. Now, if you have a cable connection, you are actually connected to a distribution network. You're, that's actually part of what it is. Now, the distribution network architecture can be composed of fiber optic cabling, coaxial cabling, and or the hybrid fiber coax cabling, or HFC. The HFC distribution network is actually becoming more and more common because it can carry more and more data. As a general rule, the final distribution to the premise, so where it enters your house and enters your cable modem, is usually through a coaxial cable. Now, unlike DSL, which has a dedicated uh, link between you and the central office, uh, the bandwidth on a cable connection is shared by the distribution network. Uh, this can actually lead to increased latency and congestion, particularly during certain times of the, of the day when everybody is either checking their emails in the morning or in the evening when they're watching Netflix. You could end up with some latency issues depending upon who your cable provider is. Uh, most distribution networks handle anywhere from, you know, 2,000, what is it, 2,000 to 4,000, almost 5,000 uh, people on a distribution network, and you're all sharing the same bandwidth. Another thing that you need to be aware of when you're dealing with cable is that your cable modem is needs to meet the data over cable service interface specification, the DOCSIS specification that your cable provider is using, what their current standard is. Actually, not what their current standard is, but what standard they're operating up to if you want to receive all of the potential bandwidth that you're due. The current DOCSIS standard is 3.1. Well, I had that slide in there twice. Sorry. Now let's talk about fiber, or fiber optic WAN technology. That's using light to transmit data and voice. Why do we use fiber? Because it allows for more bandwidth over greater distances. Why don't we always use fiber optic? Because it's more expensive to install. It's harder to work with. It's not as flexible but it is also less susceptible to line noise or interference, and it's awfully hard to tap. It's awfully hard to ease drop on, unlike the other uh, forms of WAN technology. The fiber synchronous data transmission standard in the United States is the Synchronous Optical Network, or SONNET standard. The international version is Synchronous Digital Hierarchy, or SDH. Now, SONNET and SDH define the base rates of transmission, which are known as optical carrier levels, or OC levels. Remember a few slides back, I talked about the OC level. Uh, I talked about the OC level of the ATM networks. And then I told you we'd get to it later. Well, now it's later. Well, kind of later, partially later. Um, I'm just mentioning them here. We get to talk about them some more later. 
So now how do you get more than one light signal down a path, down a single fiber? Well, you can use dense wavelength division multiplexing, or DWDM. It is a method of multiplexing, which means uh, modulating the signals and kind of weaving them together. Uh, but it's a way of multiplexing several optical carriers into a single optical fiber, which does effectively um, does effectively increase the bandwidth of of that single fiber. Now, if you use DWDM, you can actually get up to 32 OCs traveling down a single optical fiber. That is a lot. Uh, another standard that's out there that I don't have in this, this slide is coarse wavelength division multiplexing. Uh, guess what? Coarse, the coarse the coarse wavelength division multiplexing is not as dense as dense wavelength division multiplexing. You can only get up to eight optical carriers down a single fiber using CWDM. Now when you get to the point of distribution, more than likely you're dealing with a passive optical network, a PON. A PON is a point to multi-point technology that uses a single optical fiber to connect multiple locations to the internet. Now, a pond does use optical splitters, kind of like mirrors, to kind of multiplex everything into a single signal and or to spread it out. There we go. Uh, it does offer download speeds typically between 155 to 655 megabits per second with upload speeds of 155 megabits per second. Now that we've got the easy ones out of the way, let's talk about microwave or satellite. This is using uh, microwave transmission for over-the-air methods to transmit voice and data. Uh, and microwave or satellite networking can be an effective means of extending networks into places that are hard to reach. Uh, they use microwave radio relay. That's because they are a line of sight method of transmitting. That means that the, the relay stations are for, for the data to pass from point to point. The points actually have to see each other, not necessarily physically, but you have to be able to draw a straight line from one to the other without the earth getting in the way. A lot of the times you will find uh, communication satellites, surprisingly enough, in satellite networking. Uh, these are comsats, and they, like I put here, they may form part of the microwave relay network. Not always when you're using microwave, but always when you're using satellite. Now, comsats uh, do reside in a variety of different orbits. Uh, there's the molina, the geostationary, the low polar or polar orbit. One of the things to remember is that the low polar and polar or orbits are used to boost the microwave signal before sending the signal back to Earth. Now there is a drawback to using satellite networking and that has to deal with latency. Latency is the amount of time that it takes from when you send a command for that command to go from point A to point B. And if you think about it with satellite communication, when you send a request and retrieve a web page, it goes from your computer to your satellite dish. Uh, it goes up about is it either 12,000 or 22,000 miles up in the air to the satellite, to the ComSat. It's probably passed to another satellite that's however many thousands of miles away, and then it could go to a satellite at a low polar orbit where the signal gets boosted and then it gets sent back down to the Earth, to the, to the web server. It reads it, it responds, and it sends everything back in the reverse order. Guess what? That all takes time. That's latency. Don't recommend using satellite unless you absolutely have to. Um, this, this slide is out of date, and I apologize, but I'm going to run through it anyways. 
you can use uh, cellular networking as a type of WAN technology. Now, you could not use first-generation cellular to do that because it was only capable of carrying voice transmissions. You could not use second generation, well, that's kind of a lie, and I'll get to that in a moment. You could not use second generation cellular, but it did add simple data transmissions to the cellular network, and that was the beginning of text messaging. Well, before they, before they rolled out 3G, they decided that, you know what, mobile users are becoming more and more, maybe we can get them on the internet, so they developed uh, 2G, or second generation, edge networking. Uh, that was pretty simple and slow connection, but it worked for most of us when it came first came out, and we were really excited when it came out. Well, that wasn't quite enough, so then they rolled out third generation cellular, cellular, and it's the true beginning of cellular networking. This is where all the smartphones started to proliferate. But that still isn't quite fast enough, so then, so then they rolled out 4G. And I'll talk about 4G here in a moment, but I'm going to kind of go back to 3G, kind of. So between the time they rolled out third generation and first, first generation, they rolled out Evolved High Speed Packet Access, which surprisingly enough is actually called HSPA+. I don't know why they didn't call it EHSPA+. Now, that's kind of a mouthful, but that's beside, besides the point. But HSPA plus was a stopgap between third generation and 4, 4G cellular communication and cellular networking. A little bit slow, but still better than straight 3G networking. But HSPA plus, HSPA plus, yeah, I did say that, right? Uh, kind of evolved into 4G networking, and currently 4G is an emerging technology. They have not quite satisfied or firmly established everything yet. But 4G actually consists of LTE and WiMAX. Um, LTE stands for long-term evolution, and it uses an all-IP-based core with high data rates. It is compatible with 3G WiMAX with download speeds, and here's where I'm wrong, so I'm sorry. Uh, I don't remember what the current standards are for LTE, but those are wrong. My apologies. Along with LTE, we have WiMAX. Now, WiMAX is sometimes considered part of 4G, but it's really not. What WiMAX really is, is microwave transmissions. It is microwave networking, uh, which means that you have to have uh, line of sight and microwave relay stations. But actually, nowadays, it works really well. It was originally developed as the last mile alternative for when DSL or cable were not available. The only problem with WiMAX is it is only compatible with LTE. Uh, as far as current standards go, my slide is wrong again. I apologize. So now let's talk about some of the current standards. You have T lines or T carrier lines. T lines are used in the US, Japan, and South Korea. E lines are used in Europe and most of the rest of the world. And then you have OC, OC lines, for optical carrier level lines. Common speeds on the T1, well actually common speeds. You have the T1, that's 1.544 megabits per second. Um, then you have a T3 line. T3 line is capable of 44.736 megabits per second, and it's actually composed of 28 T1 lines. Oh, there we go. That's where I that's where I put it. So your T1 line, I'm going to go back to that for a moment, is actually composed of 24 DSO channels or DNDS, so DS0 channels. 
each running 64 kilobits per second. So your T1 has 24 DS zeros, which can also be called DS ones. Now, when you get to the E lines, the E line has a max speed of 2.048 megabits per second, so it's faster than an E1. And part of the reason why it's faster than an E1 is it uses 30 DS0 channels, so it uses a few more channels to, to bring that speed up a little bit more. So when you get to the E3 line, it only has a max speed of 34.368 megabits per second, it's not as fast as a T3, and that's because it uses 16 E1 lines. Now let's talk about the optical carrier level lines. Oh man, I was wrong earlier. I apologize. We'll correct it now. An OC1 is capable of 51.84 megabits per second. Actually, no, my slide's wrong. That is an OC3. That one that says OC2, that's actually an OC3 which is capable of 155.52 megabits per second. OC12 is 622.08 megabits per second. And if you want, in, want to get into the gigabit range, well, you can have an OC48, which is capable of handling 2.488 gigabits per second. And... Um, Then you have the OC192, which is capable of 9.953 gigabits per second. That's commonly referred to as 10 gigabits per second networking. Guess what? We're done with 3.4. That is a ton of information, but I still have a whole other section to go. I apologize. I didn't plan on it being this long. Three point three? Three point four. Ah, okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna need to work on this because I think this is three point five. That's what happens when you get stuck on side projects. Things kind of get a little bit wonky. So let's talk about network topologies. A topology is basically a map that can describe how a network is laid out or how the network functions. So when you're talking about topology, your topology can either be logical or it can be physical. A logical topology describes how describes the theoretical signal path of the network. The physical topology actually describes the physical layout of the network. Most often when we're talking about network topologies, we're actually talking about the physical layout, but just keep in mind it doesn't have to. So now let's move on to the actual topologies themselves. And the first one that we have to ask is, are peer-to-peer -peer and client-server networks really examples of topologies? No, they're not, because they don't describe the signal path or the physical layout of the network. But yes, they are, they are kind of considered topologies because they describe how the network functions. How do they function? Peer-to-peer -to -peer topology. The nodes control and grant access to the two resources on the network. Each individual node is responsible for the resources it is willing to share on the network. There is no one node or a group of nodes that controls access to a specific type of research, resource. There are no servers present. Then you have the client-server topology in which access to networks resources is controlled by a central server or servers. A, a server determines what resources get shared, who is allowed to use those resources, and even when the resources can be used. You can end up with a hybrid topology, and that is where you have a combination of peer-to-peer -peer and client-server networking. It's not very common, but it, you can still come across it. Now let's talk about the original Ethernet sta standard, which established a bus topology. And that was both 
physical and logical. The signal went down the cable from end to end, and it always the signal always traveled end to end. Um, yeah, yeah. Always traveled end to end. Um, this did lead to some development problems, and uh, that led to the development of different. Uh, as time went on, the bus did develop some problems. This this led to the development of different physical topologies. However, the logical topology still remains a bus topology when you're talking about Ethernet. So when you're talking Ethernet, it is always a logical bus, even though it may be a different physical topology. What are some of those different physical topologies? Oh, back to the bus. Here we go. Sorry. Uh, so that, like I said earlier, the bus, the signal traverses from one end of the network to the other end of the network. If you've got a break in the line, you broke the network. Also, in a bus topology, the the nodes or the computers actually tapped into the bus line. You had to have terminating devices on either end of the line to absorb the network signal and to reduce signal bounce. In a bus topology, physical topology, the cable is the central point, which leads us to the ring topology. A ring is a bus line with the endpoints connected together. A break in the ring breaks the ring. Often with the ring topology, it's, it's implemented with multiple rings, often two, that will counter rotate. Now, ring topologies are not very common in the local area network, but they are still a valid topology in the metropolitan area network and in the wide area network, particularly when you're dealing with fiber optic networking or the sonnet standards. Then we have the star topology. With a star, the nodes radiate out from a central point, just like this image shows. Uh, when it's implemented with a hub, uh, when you break a segment, more than likely, you're going to break the bus. Uh, it will no longer function properly. It may still limp along, but it's not going to work very well. When you, it's implemented with a switch, which I've got imaged there, a break in the segment only brings down the segment that is broken. Now, the star topology is the most common physical implementation that you will find in modern networks. Then we have the mesh. This is where there are multiple connections between the nodes on the network. A full mesh, which I've got imaged here, means that every node has a physical connection to every other node. A full mesh topology is expensive to install because of the amount of wiring that's required and the amount of network interface controllers, or NICs, that are required. If you're going to see a mesh in a network, more than likely you're going to see a partial mesh. That's where they just create a couple of redundant paths on the network. Um, and that's actually for redundancy and security and not re security, but safety. In case a link, a single link goes down, everything can still go. Then we have point to point. On a point to point, that's two nodes connected together, directly together. That's two PCs connected with a crossover cable. They will create a point to point topology. If you have two routers using a leased line to connect them, that is a point-to-point -point topology. There is no central device that is required to manage that connection. The, the end devices actually manage it on their own. It is not a common topology in our modern local area networks, but it is very much a common topology when you're talking about wide area network connections. Then you have the point-to-point or excuse me, the point to multi-point topology. In this case, you have a central device that controls the paths to all other devices. Now, this is different from a star in that the central device is intelligent. 
It's much more intelligent than what you'll find as the central device in a star. Wireless networks are, are actually a, a version of a point-to-multipoint topology. All of the devices that connect to the wireless access point, all of those devices are the multipoint, and the wireless access, access point is the point. Okay, it's also a common topology when you're talking about uh, wide area network topologies. Often instead of running a full mesh between multi-sites, you will have the headquarters building be the point and all the branch offices be the multi-point feeding into the point. So if one branch wants to speak to another, it actually needs to send that transmission to the headquarters for that point device, receives it, and then sends it out to the other branch. And last up is MPLS, multi-protocol label switching. Now this is considered a topology, and I'm not sure why. But since that's the category that it's put into, here we go. Now MPLS is a topology that is being used to replace frame frame relay switching, and ATM switching. So it is a topology that is replacing those other technologies. Uh, even though I put it here, it's, it is a topology because it specifies both a signal path and a layout. That's, that's kind of true, but kind of not. But that's how CompTIA has decided to uh, identify it, so that's how we're going to talk about it. Now, MPLS is actually a pretty good technology. Uh, it's often used to improve the quality of service and the flow of network traffic, and it does this by using a label edge router, which will receive incoming packets, and packets that don't have MPLS labels on them, it adds the labels to them. Now those labels will, will determine how the label switching router, or LSR, switches those packets on the network. You can program MPLS to be highly uh, efficient with streaming services. It, it is not as inefficient as ATM. And one of the things that's pretty cool about MPLS is it can take frame relay traffic and ATM traffic and it can handle it, deal with it, and get it to the correct de destination. As a matter of fact, the performance of those two technologies actually gets improved when they got, get placed onto an MPLS topology. Now that concludes the information that I'm going to deluge you with this evening. Thank you for watching, and we'll do it again next week.